All right, I want to go through the second section of World of Wonders. This is from about page 70 to about page 121 or so. And these are divisions of the book that I've made. They are not the divisions that she made. But in general, these are where she is more of a young adult and moving on with her career. Um, she really has divided the work into smaller sections and around sometimes an element, um, an element that is an animal or a plant that she remembers from her youth. Um, other times it's about themes. And it's very important to keep in mind that whenever she does this, she comes back to the image again and again from a different angle. Or she comes back to the theme again and again from a different angle. Each time she goes over something, she changes the perspective on it. And that's why she uses primarily metonymy. That is a way of just associating an image uh, with some kind of theme. And that association she does again and again. We got into metaphor back with Antigone. Antigone um, with metaphor was using the words of one thing uh, to discuss something else. And so you might remember when Creon would talk about our ship of state has come home, he was using the words of a sea, of, you know, of sailing to talk about the city of Thebes. And that got a general idea across. You don't get that kind of writing um, in World of Wonders. When she's writing about, say, for example, a peacock or an octopus or the uh, uh, catalpa tree, she's writing about them. But she's putting that, um, that image or that theme right next to a different image or a different theme. And so there is some kind of relationship between the two, but she's not using one uh, necessarily um, to describe the other. She's placing them next to each other. Uh, let me jump in and let's go ahead and go to the corpse flower, um, which, and this is on page 73. She says, laughing eyes, my mom once observed after she first met him, to describe how his eyes shine at everything, how this man has a knack for making everyone around him feel pretty darn magnificent. You know it's very good for a man to have laughing eyes, but at that moment, his eyes weren't laughing across the restaurant table at me. His serious face told me through all the electric and fragrant greens, the spray and the shine of the wild bursts of fruit, the messy blood-red days, and the stench and the stink too. This finally was a man who never, who'd never flinch, never leave my side when things were messy, or if he was introduced to something new. This was a man who'd be happy when I bloomed. And now this is her description of her um, husband, but also of the corpse flower. And this is where she, in fact, is realizing um, that her, the man that would become her husband really does pass this test of loyalty. And that's being shown by his reaction to the corpse flower. So the corpse flower becomes a metonymical um, presence here for her evaluating her husband to be. And, and so how he responds to it tells her so much about him. She doesn't need to know more about the corpse flower. It's already exposing uh, so much of his character and what she would admire in him. But notice it comes from partly her mom and partly from her experience with the corpse flower. Okay? And those eyes are what her, his, her mom points out, that he has those eyes that he's uh, you know, kind to be with. Um, but what she recognizes is that nothing happens when the corpse flower is present. He doesn't react against it. He doesn't react against this aspect of her character um, and revolt, uh, uh, revolt against it. He stays there in his present, and that tells you so much about her, his character uh, when he's with her. And so the corpse flower stands right beside him and reveals something about his character and about his loyalty. You can tell, as she does, that this is a person who doesn't flinch, as she says, when things get messy, when things get difficult, 
he's going to stand there, and this gives it an insight into his character. Okay, um, and let me jump up a little bit. And this is the whale shark. Okay, and the whale shark is described on pages 87 to 88, um, but comes up in a number of different ways. And this story, this kind of like a myth, this Filipino myth, um, is related here. And now um, her mother is Filipina. And this story is being handed down. It's been handed down a very long line. Um, it's now being handed down from her, um, from our author, um, from Amy Nezhukamatato, um, to her own children. The story becomes the presence of the mother in the lives of the children. That story was a presence of her mother in her life. And before that, it was a story present in her mother's life from her own mother. And so this story is coming down again and again, and it's the story of the whale shark. And watch how this whale shark is present. I mean, because as you've already learned, the whale shark is entirely harmless. It couldn't be harmful if it wanted to because its throat is so small, size of a coin. Um, and she just got through talking about the fear of losing a mother and not having and being abandoned, being an orphan. And what she does is retell this story again for her own children. Um, Cable pried open the cave mouth, lid of the cookie box, he stacked the coins into a small silver city, then crashed them just to hear the noise, just to see the light disperse into hundreds of pieces on his bedroom floor, and then skipping up a, a little ways further. But Cable held tight to his coins, and this is when um, there is a flood hitting the village, and he does not look for other people in the family um, to try to rescue them or be rescued by them. And so his trust in his heart is not with anybody else. It's with his coins. But Kabale held tight to his coins, and his coins held him. Um, please understand that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor um, inside of a metonymy. The story sits next to um, her being a mother. Um, and the metaphor here is the coins held him. Coins don't have arms. okay? And the coins hold him as in... He feels the warmth from the coins, but of course the coins have no warmth for him. That's absurd. So that's a metaphor inside of a metonymy. He held them so tight, they pressed into his body and left white spots. Of course they didn't. Those are the spots that are on the outside of the whale shark. That explains, if you know Rudyard Kipling's stories, um, the just so stories about like how the leopard got its spots and other things, um, then you'll have a sense of what this myth is about. Okay, Those spots are the expression of the coins on, a, on the whale's back, um, but they're also the, the resonance of Cable uh, holding on tight to his coins, one after the other, until his whole black back was dotted. Cable's legs shrank into fins. His mouth became a small cave, and the bubbles that popped from it were silver. Sometimes at sea you can still see Cable and his wide, searching, uh, wide eyes searching for a small ship, a scrap of moonlight. Okay? And that's him realizing he held on to his coins. He's marked forever by that. And he's looking for a small ship. In other words, his family. He's left alone. And this story, this is what is how the mother is always present in this story with the children. Um, and, you know, that's so much of it, is being a parent, is always being present. And this story substitutes, in many ways, for the presence of the mother. Um, this is a teaching for the child, where the child can learn from the story again and again um, what it is to be motherless. It's to be the whale shark. Um, when you're concentrating too much on yourself and on your greed, you will end up being motherless and being looking, um, wide eyes searching for a small ship, a scrap of moonlight. Okay, Everything you held on to before is going to be gone and washed away. All right, now let's jump on to the next one. So that's the whale shark. 
And those are the things that are going on. And I, I want to emphasize, you can see this with it, um, there's so much in this book um, that goes on that's easy to just read over and just go, that was kind of confusing. But if you stop and think about it for a bit, and I, I really want to emphasize, you will come up with different interpretations of similar scenes. But if you stop and think about why would she write this about the whale shark? And why this story about Cavalier and the, the spots on the whale shark's back? Um, that's what I've come up with. My interpretation is about the presence of the mother in the story itself that's handed down through generations and through a culture and is always present. Okay, And so give it some thought whenever you see something Always assume it's there for a reason, and then go through and try to figure it out. Okay? Coming up on the last one, the octopus, which is a stunning little image and a stunning little animal. Um, and this is a story that gets set up with her as a mother, and she's out with her children um, near the water in the Aegean, in other words, near Greece. And um, the children go off as she's been trying to raise them to appreciate the oddities and the peculiarities of nature. They go off and they find an octopus. And they come up and they deliver to her an octopus that they found. And it's exactly the type of thing which she was instructing them to do. It really is to appreciate and find fascination in nature. And watch how this goes. It's very odd and unusual. Instead, I focused on its golden eye and how it fixed upon my shape, how its arms wrapped and dropped around my wrist and up my forearm while it took me in, tasted me. Now, I want to emphasize something. All of this is wrong, okay? And she's going to show you that in a moment, but she's not going to tell you it while she's doing it. Um, this is going to get juxtaposed to what's going to happen to what's really going on, okay? And so all of this is wrong, and it stays wrong for a little bit longer. In those moments I held it, how many things it might have felt or known about me. Notice that she's kind of bonding with the animal here, and it's there's wonder here. And this was a gift from her own children. This is kind of one of those magical moments. Could it sense the love and exhilaration I felt for it? And could it feel that? And I really want to emphasize that everything you've read in this passage so far is entirely wrong. And she knows that. And that gets juxtaposed with what was really going on all along, which starts up right here. Or my sheer despair once I realized it was dying in my hands. I only know that I had never been looked at, consumed, or questioned so carefully by another being. And what started off as a moment of wonder, where she was projecting onto the octopus uh, the shared sense of wonder that it must be tasting me and looking at me and admiring me and does it just share my exhilaration. And all along, it was dying. And so everything about that golden eye and wrapping, wrapping around uh, her wrist and forearm and the tasting, it was dying the entire time, and it couldn't do anything about it. Where she was feeling fascination and wonder, it was experiencing dread and terror, probably in hopelessness as it was dying. And she turns that on its head entirely. She knows all along while she's writing this that this octopus is going to die, of course. She's setting it up for what was really going on, um, which was that it was dying. And notice that this was a gift from her children. She has shared that wonder, that sense of wonder in nature, and it's turned out so terribly in the, you know, in the octopus. It goes on and she uses the colors that are in the octopus to reflect the sky, the Aegean. And so she is going on with the, the basic metonymic um, imagery. She goes on, but she's hollowing them out at times, and she's doing this for a reason. Okay, And I'll leave it at that, but I want you to always pick up these moments 
and pause here and there and reflect on why would she have done this? Why is this going on this way? And come up with your own explanation. Take account of what she writes about. Notice the way she writes with this sense of wonder at the first part of the quotation, but it all, right in the middle of a sentence, turns to despair and it's dying in her hands. The eye could not be um, looking at her with a sense of fascination or anything like that. It was looking on her with a sense of desperation um, as he was dying. So she could not perceive that at all because her wonder was there and blinding her to what was going on. Um, always when you read through this, uh, take a moment and stop and think about the value of what's going on, the reflection. Okay, I'll stop it there. Um, good luck with this. Take care.